Thank you. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, I would like to greet you with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, that it may guide us all this week, liberated by God's grace. It is very good when sisters and brothers in Christ meet together under one tent, in one assembly. For this reason, on my behalf as a president of LWF, I would like to welcome all of you to this assembly. Let us together make this assembly a celebrative, joyful, but at the same time, an assembly which will guide our work for the next seven years, which will help us to see what is the purpose of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to us in mission and prophetic diaconia. By these words, I would like to welcome all of you, and I hope you will enjoy this assembly that can be a remarkable historical moment in the history of our communion. May I ask now the General Secretary to, read, to have the roll call. The online registration until last Sunday of Assembly Delegates showed a number of 323 delegates registered to this assembly, out of which by 10 o'clock this morning, we had 282 registering here. The quorum of three quarters is 242, meaning that we do have the quorum required according to constitution. Thank you, Mr. General Secretary. As we have a quorum, so I will constitute the legality of this assembly, and we start this assembly in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I would like first to introduce those who are with the General Secretary and myself on the podium. We have Her Grace Bishop Glorias from Chile, who is a Vice President of Latin America, and she will be taking the timing for those who will express themselves or, or have the right to voice. You are welcome. And also we have Bishop Alex Malasusa, who is the Vice President for the African region, he himself comes from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania, and he will be sharing part of this plenary. You are heartily welcome. May I, we are now here upon the invitation of the United Church Council, Namibia Evangelical Lutheran Churches, who invited us and extended an official one come to all assembly delegates and participants. I want to remind you that the three churches invited us to Namibia. And I am really honored to invite now the president, uh, the, the, the presiding bishop of the United Church of Council, Bishop Ernst Gamkapku, to come here to the podium. And also I would like to ask the bishops of the Church of Namibia to come here also to the podium. Please, can you please join us here? I would like you to give a word of greeting. Please join me in welcoming the, the bishops of the churches in Namibia.
May I request the Namibian and the African delegates, uh, the women, to Zululaid. <laughs> and uh, uh, stronger. <laughs> stronger. <laughs> Thank you. The president of the Lutheran World Federation, Bishop Dr. Munib Hunan, the vice presidents, the general secretary of the LWF, Reverend Dr. Martin Junge, delegates to the 12th Lutheran World Assembly, special guest to this assembly, members of the media, sisters, and brothers. It is good to have a background, you see, where we are coming from. And if they are behind my back, if I do have that support, I feel so strong. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, at the very beginning, let me welcome you to this 12th Assembly. The 12th Assembly, which is of the special reference to the word, the theme, which is very, very important in our lives, liberated by God's grace, flanked with the three sub-themes. I welcome you to the city of Ventuk and to the Republic of Namibia, and especially to the Christians in Namibia with a special reference of the Lutheran churches in Namibia. So it is my privilege to welcome you to the city of Ventuk and to the independent and democratic Namibia. The city of Ventuk in the Namibian languages, such as the Kwekwe Kova, is known as Aitams literally meaning hot springs. In Oshiherero, it is known as, as Oshemuise, literally meaning place of steam. It is the capital and largest city in the Republic of Namibia. This city was founded by a black Namibian years back ago, his name is Jan of Jonker Afrikaner as the site of a permanent spring. Most importantly, Jonker Afrikaner built the first stone church building, which is today known as the Lucas Church in Ventuk. And for historical purposes, it must be re-emphasized that the first church was not built by a German or Finnish missionaries, <laughs> but by an African Christian leader, Jonker Afrikaner. <laughs> Today, Ventuk is the social, economic, political, and cultural center of the country. It is also the reputation to be the cleanest city in the entire Africa. Differently expressed, Africa is not just merely about impressive animals, stunning deserts, and beautiful savannas. It is also home to astonishing cities and towns that are rich in culture, civilization, history with deep roots in Christianity, cities which can host big events like this one. Ventuk is also well known for the killings of blacks which, which took place on 10th of, 10th of December 1959. After peaceful demonstrations and protests against the white government's attempt to resettle black Namibians further from white neighborhoods in Ventuk, the police opened fire on the protesters, 
killing 11 and wounding 44 others. This event is known as the Old Location Uprising and is today celebrated on 10th of December as the Human Rights Day and is a Namibian national holiday. I do welcome you to this Lutheran house on behalf of the Namibian Lutheran churches that are members of the Lutheran World Federation. Dear sisters and brothers, you are here on our invitation invitation from the three Lutheran churches who are hosting this awesome occasion or uh, awesome celebration in collaboration with the Lutheran World Federation. And our names are the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Namibia, Elsin, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Namibia, German Evangelical Lutheran Church, Elsin Delk, Evangelical Lutheran Church in the Republic of Namibia, ELCRN. These three Namibian Lutheran churches are welcoming you to the 12th Assembly. The theme is, as we know, liberated by God's grace, flanked by the three sub-themes, salvation not for sale, human beings not for sale, creation not for sale. Under this theme, we are set to determine the future direction of the Lutheran World Federation, share experiences about issues facing the communion, worship together, celebrating cultural diversity, and in particularly to commemorate 500 years of reformation. In this regard, and most importantly, from the Namibian, or more accurately, from African Christian pers perspective, the 12th Assembly also will be the opportunity to commemorate joyfully 500 years of reformation at a global level. I'm welcoming you to the Namibian Christianity while we are celebrating 500 years of reformation because and solely through the direct influence of the reformation history Namibia was able to participate in the Misio Day of God. The fruits of such mission is that today Namibia is a predominantly Christian country on the African continent. Almost 90% of the inhabitants happen to be Christians. For us, as the Namibian Lutheran, Lutheran churches together with you, it is, the, it is central to reinterpret Martin Luther's theology. For example, Namibian theologians rediscovered that Luther's question, where do we find a merciful God, is always directly linked to the cry, how can we be merciful neighbors to one another? Having been made righteous to Christ or by Christ and to him, as Luther observes, we must become a Christ towards the neighbor by engaging the poor to have the daily bread. On, it is on this basis that such biblical, theological, and ecclesiological reinterpretations, and I'm welcoming you to this occasion that is filled with God's grace this occasion, the 12th Assembly of the Lutheran World Federation. And imagine, here in Namibia, on the African soil, African continent, we celebrate and commemorate 500 years of the history of Lutheranism and Reformation. And as we are standing here, we stand stand here before you by grace of God. We stand before you 
reiterating salvation is not for sale. We stand before you boldly proclaiming human beings are not for sale. Here we stand fiercely shouting creation is not for sale. Once again, on behalf of the bishops here and the members that we do represent, let me in bold humility shout out, welcome God's people liberated by God's grace. And you will shout back to me, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you very much for these kind words. Thank you. He assured me I feel at home already. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Bishop Ernst. Please tell your members of the congregations and your churches we already feel welcomed and feel at home here. Thank you very much for the welcome. I mean, I, we also are thankful for UCC, NELC, that they have appointed a local preparatory committee that prepared everything here for us. And I would like to welcome, first of all, the chairperson, who is Reverend Dr. Emma Nangola, Nangolo. Where is Emma? Emma? Maybe she is preparing something for us. Yes. <laughs> yes. May I also invite, you know, I would like to have her. Maybe somebody can call her. We can postpone that until she comes. We can, we can just uh, wait for until she comes because I need also the preparatory committee to be with us. But at the same time, I would like here to recognize special guests who are among us. First of all, I would like to, to invite, you know, uh, to, uh, to, well, to acknowledge the presence of the government of Namibia, who is Bishop Kamita, who is at the same time the Minister of Poverty Eradication in the government of Namibia. Thank you. <laughs> Brother Kamita, we will express the thank you for you and for your government. We are very thankful. All of us got visas, all of us here at home in Namibia. Namibia is now our second home. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, 10 minutes, fine, fine. I would like also to welcome and recognize and thank our ecumenical guests for the presence with us who will bring their greetings 
at different moments throughout the assembly. May please, could you please welcome all our ecumenical guests who are sitting on my left side. Could you please stand? We have also uh, two guests who served the communion. They are no more guests, they are honorary brothers. One of them will be arriving this evening, who used to be the former, pre who used to be the president of the Lutheran Federation, and that's Bishop Dr. Mark Hansen, who will arrive this evening, and we will we'll have time to welcome him. But at the same time, I would like to welcome also our former General Secretary, Reverend Dr. Ishmael Noko, who is with us these days, and I would like to ask him to come to sit here with, the, with, with us as honorary, as honorary uh, General Secretary and guest with us. Could you, where is Ishmael? Ishmael. Please welcome him. Heartly welcome. We also have, you know, this wish, distinguished visitor from foreign countries. We have a, a special visitor and distinguished one from Germany, Herr Bodo Ramelov, who is the minister president of Thuringen, Germany, who is present today and tomorrow with us. It's a great honor, Mr. President, Minister President, that you are with us here. Please join me in welcoming him. I think now we conclude the welcoming only. There is one item when when, when Emma comes, I'll go to, the, to want to go back. Now we go a little bit to business. And I've seen that you have learned how really to vote, and we will have some votes now. Please you, uh, prepare your machines. And when I tell you I want to say, now we vote, then you vote. Number one is yes for it. Number two is against. And number three is abstention. And now we will go to our agenda. Adoption of agenda and assembly, assembly agenda and schedule, which is exhibit 3.2 in your files. 3.2 in your files. It's recommended to adopt the assembly agenda and schedule exhibit 3.2 with the understanding that the course of the assembly and upon recommendation of the business committee New items or changes to the agenda might need to be introduced in the interest of the whole assembly. Who moves it? Who moves it? Somebody must move and somebody must second. Moved. Who seconds it? Support. Support. Second it. Any more discussion? Please, if you, if you are in favor, press one against two. Abstentions three. Now vote. <laughs> vote is closing. It's closed. <laughs> so thank you. So we have 96, so it is adopted. Thank you very much. We go to Code of Conduct Participants in Events Organized by the LWF. Uh, Mr. Rally uh, Defelbo has explained what it is about, and now we have to have an action. It's recommended to approve the Code of Conduct for Participant in Events Organized by the Lutheran World Federation, Exhibit 3-4, and to appoint the following persons as the response team, Professor Dr. Bernard Oberdorfer, Mr. Kulikani Sizwe Magwaza, Ms. Ranjita Christi Borgorari, 
Mr. Stieg Lundberg and Reverend Marcia Blasi. Who moves it? Can you stand up, please? Those names, can you stand up? Thank you. Who moves it? It's moved. It's seconded. Are you ready to vote? We vote now. <laughs> Voting is closing. Voting is closed. What is the result? So it's adopted. Thank you very much. Adoption of procedure for the 12th Assembly. It's recommended to approve the proposed rules and procedures for the 12th Assembly, which is with you in Exhibit 3.4. Who moves it? It's moved. Who seconds it? Seconded. Are you ready to vote? Are you ready to vote? Yes. Now we vote now voting is now. Vote now. Voting is closing. Voting is closed. What is the result? It's adopted. Thank you very much. Now it take it gives me a great pleasure that we are today in the 12th assembly. That means we had 11 assemblies behind us. The 11th assembly in Stuttgart, when LWF apologized to the Mennonites because of wrongdoings of the past with ramifications until today. It was one of the most moving and spiritually filled moments to, of the assembly in Stuttgart when we apologized and used the Mennonite way of washing each other's feet. The Mennonite action liberated Lutherans and Mennonites together from the burdens of the past to deeper theological studies. It strengthened our joint witness to the world. This 12th Assembly is not a standing alone event, but connects us with our earlier journey. This is why we thought of connecting this assembly with our last assembly, now beginning, and start with words of greetings from our Mennonite sisters and brothers. In doing so, we are underlining that our approach to the Reformation won't undo the ecumenical achievements of the past, but bring them into the picture and build on them. I invite Reverend Cesar Garcia, the General Secretary, of the Mennonite World Council to bring his greetings. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Grazia. Thank you, President Yunan. It is with profound gratitude and humility that I greet this gathering in the name of the Mennonite World Conference, a global Anabaptist Mennonite communion of 105 member groups in around 60 countries. Dear President, dear General Secretary, dear Assembly delegates, guests and observers, dear sisters and brothers in Christ, as a stepchildren of the Reformation, we are honored to join you in the celebration of your 500th birthday. And it is a special joy to celebrate your long tradition here in Namibia, in the continent of Africa, home to some of the most vibrant expressions of the ongoing renewal of the church that Luther and others began so many years ago in Germany. As many of you know, the Anabaptist tradition that I represent also traces its beginnings back to the 16th century. For many years, centuries really, we generally told the story of the early Anabaptists through the lens of our martyr history. 
In that simplistic version of the story, our ancestors were the true <clears throat> reformers, while Luther, Swingley, and Calvin were indistinguishable from the Catholic theologians in calling on the state to enforce religious reform with violence. Today, thanks be to God and the initiative of the Lutheran World Federation, we have been invited to tell our history in a new way. <clears throat> Seven years ago, at the 11th Assembly of the Lutheran World Federation in Stuttgart, Germany, we joined you in a worship service of mutual repentance and forgiveness. That service marked the culmination of nearly 30 years of ecumenical conversations, first at a regional level and then in the form of a joint Lutheran Mennonite International Study Commission that convened from 2002 through 2008. The work of that commission, summarized in a document called Healing Memories Reconciled in Christ, included a careful exploration of the condemnations of Anabaptists in the Augsburg Confession. But most importantly, the commission recognized that reconciliation between our two traditions could go forward only through a shared commitment to rightly remembering, rightly remembering our history. That is, to a more careful telling of our origins in the 16th century that resisted the impulse of both sides to caricatures or heroic simplifications. We both had much to repent for in the actions of our spiritual ancestors. The commitments that we made to each other in Stuttgart were transformative. They changed the trajectory of our shared history. Today, no account of our shared origins in the contentious debates of the 16th century is adequate if it fails to include the story of our commitment to reconciliation that we made in 2010. The Lutheran One Federation demonstrated its resolve to honoring those commitments in the appointment of a task force on the Mennonite action. Just a few months ago, that group issued a wonderful collection of essays, reflections, and examples of the Lutheran Mennonite collaboration around the world in a small book called Bearing Fruit, Implications of the 2010 Reconciliation Between Lutherans and Mennonites and Baptists. The stories recounted in that book testify to the fact that in our new relationship, our witness to God's love for the world is made more fully manifest. Eight years ago, at the Mennonite World Conference Assembly in Asuncion, Paraguay, in July of 2009, Ishmael Noko, then serving as General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, addressed our global body. In a deeply moving presentation, Bishop Noko described Lutheran sorrow and regret for the events of the past. And then, anticipating the gathering here today in 2017, he concluded with a call for a renewed commitment to the continuing reformation of our tradition and of the whole church. The vulnerability you demonstrated by looking at the Augsburg Confession with new eyes, your posture of humility in expressing regret for the past, your many gestures of hospitality, and your commitment to continue to walk with us on the journey from repentance to reconciliation are all evidence of that commitment to continuing the reformation of your tradition. Thank you for allowing us to be partners in that journey as we walk together in the way of Jesus Christ, our reconciler, and the source of our common history and identity. And thank you for sharing that journey with the world, for speaking in contexts of fragmentation and nationalisms about a new reality where forgiveness and reconciliation are possible. As your General Secretary Martin Junge has said, 
the reconciliation between Mennonites and Lutherans couldn't stay among us. They had to unfold its full meaning by becoming a witness to God's intentions to the entire world. May God lead us in that endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Cesar Garcias, for this word, for our renewed relationships. Thank God for them. I think now I understand that Reverend Dr. Emma Nangolo is in the room. May I ask her to come forward with the preparatory committee, the local preparatory committee, LPC, LAPC. May I ask you to come forward, all of you, Emma? I will recognize all of them, please. There are many working. Yes. These are some of them. The others are working or preparing some for, something for us. Please join me in welcoming them. to recognize them for what they have done, that we feel everything is okay, may I ask what Bishop Ernst asked from the African women to express their thank you in the African way. I, did, I don't hear anything, Bishop Ernst. <laughs> Isn't it exciting to be in Namibia with such a beautiful spirit? Now we go to business again. A appointment of assembly committees. I think you have it in your files, Exhibit 4. It's recommended to appoint the following assembly committees and their members as per Exhibit 4. Business committee, policy and reference committee, editorial committee, Credentials and Elections Committee, Minutes Committee, Nominations Committee. I would like to ask the General Secretary, any changes on these committees? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson, President. Uh, we are talking to exhibit number four, which you should have in front of you or in, on your screens. There is one change in view of the names that have been provided to you in view of the fact that uh, one person could not come. On page three, the editorial committee, 
the, is a replacement uh, for a person who wouldn't, was not able to come, Mr. Leviticus Yusuf. He comes from the same church, represents the same category, meaning lay, male, and youth, coming from the same region, and comes with the endorsement from the church. So, Mr. President, if this is accepted um, as a replacement with the endorsement of the, uh, of the church, this would de be then, in case the vote is favorable, the editorial committee. Thank you very much. I think with this, you know, uh, amendment, who will move it? It's moved. Who seconds it? Seconded. Are you ready to vote? Please, those in favor, one, against two, abstention three. Now we vote. Vote is closing. Vote is closed. So it's adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, uh, the committees, I hope they will start now their meetings, and now they are constituted as official committees of the assembly. May I, on this, you know, at, at this point, hand the chair to the Vice President for Africa, Bishop Alex Malasusa, to take over. Thank you, President. Um, now we'll be dealing with the Exhibit 5.1. And I would like to inform you that uh, the address of the president is being distributed to the delegates who had requested the hard copies. The electronic version has now been made available on the C file link for those who prefer reading electronic version. So humbly now, I would like to welcome President Bishop Dr. Mundi Bionan to address the assembly. Welcome, Bishop. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, I greet each of you in the name of Jesus, the one who liberates us in God's grace from Jerusalem, the city of our Lord's crucifixion and resurrection. It's a great pleasure to be with you here in Namibia, a country and the people showing us every day what it means to overcome adversity in unity, seeking God's will for all. I'm especially grateful to the United Church Council of the Namibian Evangelical Lutheran Churches. You are hosting us with tremendous hospitality and grace. When we are in Namibia, we cannot help but be inspired by the smiles of this country's citizens. It's a smile of deep wisdom that knows pain but emphasizes joy. We Palestinians are known for our hospitality, but Namibians put us to shame with their smiles. I am proud to have served for these seven years as president of our global communion. Together we live in vibrant witness to God's work in the world offering our hands and feet in the service of God's mission. The ongoing work of liberation. Throughout the world, we are seeing the ongoing work of God's liberation. Liberation is God's will for all the, its humanity. This is as true here in Namibia as in other parts of the planet. I have followed the Namibian struggle for liberation since the 1970s when I was a young Palestinian theolo theologian studying in Finland. Namibian struggle became part of my struggle. As well, when it finally came, I celebrated Namibian freedom as, as if it were my own liberation. From the context of my struggle, I'm aware that political liberation alone does not achieve all that needs to be accomplished for the healing of a nation. This work of promoting healing throughout unity is being undertaken by the Namibian government, but also by all the churches. The varied histories of Namibia have produced three distinct Lutheran churches. We deeply respect the unity 
they have been able to achieve in the United Church Council. We know that this emerging unity does not forget the pain of the past and present. The struggle for liberation was a, so a source of great suffering, even as it produced so much good in the form of political freedom. We thank God that Namibia is a state seeking economic and social development in order to satisfy the needs of all their people throughout their large and beautiful territory. With the three churches hosting us here in Namibia, we have rejoiced with them about their journey of liberation and independence. The LWF has, has often been humbling when the churches have acknowledged our global communion's contribution to this journey in accompaniment, support, and solidarity. That accompaniment continues today. We agree with our host churches that growing unity and progress in Namibia cannot be used to ignore trauma. Memories of past injustices must be acknowledged and honored before they can be healed. In Namibia, this process of, no, of acknowledging past wrongs and healing memories of trauma can be greatly helped by the much appreciated confession of the Evangelical Church in Germany, AKD, concerning German colonial crimes in Namibia. These crimes especially affected the Herero, Nama, Damara, San, Khoisan peoples. The AKD statements of the, on the genocide in former German South Af Southwest Africa titled, Forgive Us Our Sins, openly acknowledges that the annihilation orders issued in October 1904 against the Herero people and in April 1905 against the Nama people were clear clearly genocidal. We deeply appreciate the clarity and depth of the AKD confession towards the entire Namibian people and towards God. This is a great sin which cannot be justified. In addition of to producing faithful approach that honors memory, the AKD apology addresses present needs within Namibian churches and society, especially heartening to see how the apology points toward a process of revisiting partnership agreements since the current format of partnership still mirrors its colonial roots and has been one of the stumbling blocks on the way to unity. Decolonizing these structures is an essential step toward addressing imbalances of power and building right relationship. We acknowledge that this document is a midpoint in an ongoing process. It builds on dialogue and looks forward to further engagement. Only when the truth has been told and justice sought can reconciliation over the pains of the past take place. As a global communion, we pray together and work with these churches as they find ways to facilitate similar dialogue among their respected civil governments. The LWF has been part of many different processes of historic reconciliation. In 2010, Lutherans and Mennonites culminated a process to heal memories over a painful and violent history. The joint Roman Catholic Lutheran commemoration of Reformation involved a process which addresses wrongdoings of the past with ramifications to this day. We nevertheless recognize the uniqueness of this particular trauma. Namibians and Germans, through their dialogue, process need to identify and agree on how the history will be told, how justice can be done, and how reconciliation will be promoted. Along with the encouraging Namibians and Germans to further pursue their dialogue process, the LWF is committed to offer accompaniment and support as a communion with passion for justice, peace, and reconciliation. The process among Namibians and Germans is at the heart of its vocation. I am deeply impressed by the Namibian government's Harambe Prosperity Plan. As President Hage Gaingop wrote, the Kiswahili word Harambe means pull together in the same direction. The development plan, therefore, is a call for unity, encouraging Namibians to work towards a common purpose. The plan consists of five pillars, pillars, effective governments, economic advancement, social progression, infrastructure development, and interrelation, international relations and cooperation. Harambe, 
and the work of the Namibian people can be an inspiration for the life of our global communion. We can learn from our Namibian companions to pull together in the same direction as we participate in God's mission. Today, there is no more a big church or a small church, west or east, north or south. Today, we are accompanying each, each other as churches on the way to Emmaus, walking together, confused and challenged, but pulling together in the same direction. Our communion is responsible for mission, including prophetic diakonia in the world. We cannot be quiet here. Here in Hindu, we have an op opportunity to listen and to learn from our Namibian sisters and brothers. The message I have heard so far is that it is not just about political liberation as a one-time event, but ensuring that the fruits of liberation are manifested in the lives of all peoples. Our global communion itself is a sign of God's ongoing liberation. We come from many different countries. Some of our countries were colonized, while others are from countries that did the colonizing. This is true in Namibia, as in relation to many other places around our planet. In Latin America, for instance, we still see the legacy of dictatorships and colonial manipulation. The churches have been and continue to be divided by political questions and ethnic distinctions. In the Middle East, the churches deal daily with the 100-year legacies of the Sykes-Pico agreement agreed by Britain and France. In Israel and Palestine, we know that there are church groups standing against ongoing injustice, while others justify occupation by biblistic readings of scripture. Some of these drawings are in the past, waiting to be recognized and reconciled. Some of these injustices are ongoing, with effects throughout our relations today. Our communion carries the painful effects of colonization. But we, the 145 churches, are part of this communion, of one communion, liberated by God's grace, participating in God's mission, pulling together in the same direction to advance God's kingdom in our world. Because we are liberated by God's grace, our communion is a platform for the open exchange of ideas and perspectives, a place where we do not ignore the pressing questions of our age. Together, we have decided that we will live our, our preferential option for the poor and oppressed. We will be the voice of the voiceless. The poor will be silenced no more. This is what liberated by God's grace means in, a practical, in, practice, in practice today. Before God, we are equal, liberated. We are free to act on behalf of the world that God loves. This is the energy I hope we carry with us in the next seven years of our life together as a global communion. The ongoing reconciliation of Lund and Malmö, the historic reconciliation between the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran communion we celebrated last year in Sweden has had profound significance for global ecumenism. In 2010, Anglican theologian Andrew Magwan relayed the sense that we are now in the midst of an ecumenical winter, where the movement toward visible Christian unity had reached a low point. Magwan suggests that many Christians find their most powerful and transformative experiences of ecumenism in experience, in shared prayer and in mission. This sharing of prayer and mission is what we have experienced in Lund and Malmö. Perhaps, alongside many other movements, what we have achieved in the last decades of Lutheran-Catholic dialogue will lead to further breakthroughs of an ecumenical spring. The large event in Malmö pointed the way toward an ecumenical spring. There we highlighted diaconal collaboration as a fruit of ecumenical partnership. Instead of engaging in dialogue as a political activity to improve diplomatic relations, or an academic exercise to please nobody but sc scholars sitting in the room. The Malmö event shows how dialogue can mutually strengthen the capacity of churches to respond to world's needs. We engage in dialogue so the world may believe and be healed. Historic reconciliation, as important and monumental as it is, cannot be allowed to remain only an end in itself. This is the lesson of linking Malmö with Lund, ecumenical dialogue, 
even on the academic level, can help us discern convergences and diversity, leading us toward common mission. These dialogues must address our common search for responding to the needs of the world. In the arena, we discuss challenges facing human communities in various parts of the world. This event showed how ecumenical engagement can propel the church in the world. The agreement between Caritas and LWF World Service demonstrated ecumenism based on mutual friendship and trust. Through this agreement and our shared work, we show that we are working together, following Christ's command for the sake of the world. The event in Lund with His Holiness Pope Francis filled me with great joy. Careful planning for this event, co-hosted by Pope Francis, LWF President, and LWF General Secretary, while co-hosted locally by Archbishop Antje Jacqueline and the Catholic Bishop of Stockholm, Monsignor Andres Arborius, led to a spirit of trust and friendship. In cooperation with the Catholic Church, the prayer service in Lund has been replicated in the whole, in whole or in part, in France, Chile, Germany, Amman, Bethlehem, in the Church of Nativity. During the service in Lund, Pope Francis and I signed a joint declaration saying that through dialogue and shared witness, we are no longer strangers. Rather, we have learned that what unites us is greater than what divides us. The declaration lamented that our division had wounded the visible unity of the church and rejected all hatred and violence, past and present, especially that expressed in the name of religion. I continue looking for the Holy Spirit to guide us through issues on which we still disagree, ecclesiology, ministry, and Eucharist. Honest disagreement is the foundation of dialogue. I'm confident that we'll be able to find convergence on many issues. No matter how difficult and long it is, I encourage the communion to continue this process because it is Christ's call to have one baptism and one table for the Eucharist. It continues to be my conviction that the Eucharist table is, is the table of Christ, not a Lutheran, nor Catholic, nor Reform, nor Anglican, nor Orthodox table. It's Christ's table of generosity. God's word and promise makes a thing holy, not any human effort or label. In other words, the event in Lund is not yet finished. Its positive energy continues to expand, even into interreligious relations. But I want to share with you something that caught my attention in Lund even before we had the opportunity to have the common prayer. One day earlier, during regular Reformation Day worship at Lund Cathedral, following the liturgy of Holy Communion, something very special happened. Just before the closing hymn, we suddenly saw the Dean of St. Thomas Aquinas Parish in Lund entering into the Lutheran Cathedral with the Vatican flag, an icon of the Virgin Mary, and the entire Catholic congregation. Together they processed to the front of this Lutheran cathedral and joined the Lutheran congregation in shared song and prayers. As we gathered together around the altar, I have never seen faces so elevated and happy. It was as if we were dreaming. Many in the church were amazed. It reminded me of the day of the Pentecost when the disciples and the people were amazed with what was happening in front of their eyes. Many people were in tears. Later, some observed that our ecumenical celebration the next day would have meant very little if the local people had not embraced it so fully. This, my friends, is the positive energy emanating out of Lund. It, like the work of the Holy Spirit, it has not remained in the place alone. I'm confident that this energy will spread throughout our global communion. Each diocese and congregation had an opportunity to reach out to Catholic neighbors, urging them to build on this ecumenical energy. Just a few moments ago, I was invited to Florence, where 23 Catholic universities and organizations were discussing in a symposium on the issue of reformation. 
The energy of Lund is not limited to Christian ecumenical relations. Al Mayadeen Television station in Lebanon interviewed me about this historical reconciliation. I was told that the interview was watched by 30 million people throughout the Arab and Muslim world. Dr. Mohammed Samak has offered several comments on Catholic Lutheran re recon reconciliation. Samak, who has said that the, risk, the task of the Muslims today is to defend and purify our faith from the criminal exploitation of the jihadists, has also suggested that the Sunni and the Shia Muslim must learn from the energy of Lund to explore reconciliation between their communities as well. The energy of Lund will create more energy and trust, and not just among Lutherans and Catholics. Surely, this is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Nowhere is the need for meaningful ecumenical engagement more needed than in the Middle East. In recent years, Arab and Middle Eastern Christians is, uh, Arab have learned again that isolation is the path of destruction. Our churches, historic communities, with roots reaching back to the time of Christ, are agencies seeking ecumenical unity. In addition to facing a shared political crisis, we are experiencing ever-deepening levels of theological dialogue. If Lund only remains in Lund and does not infiltrate into the Catholic and Lutheran churches and other churches, its meaning will diminish today by day. The more we receive and implement it in our churches, the more will be created, we will be, the energy will be created. While the energy continues, we must invest in it. We must build relations with Catholics, Orthodox, Evangelicals, Anglican, and Reformed churches, along with others. The more we can build this energy, the more we'll be reminded that we share one mission in the world. The event is not finished, it continues. Just like going, the ongoing reformation of the church, the energy going out from our celebration in Lund is a sign that the Holy Spirit is still at work in our churches, liberating us by creating trust and rec reconciliation in a time of fragmented relationship. It's my sincere hope that the ecumenical winter we have been experiencing will indeed give way to an ecumenical fresh spring. LWF leadership in a religi religiously divine world. The road from conflict to communion in relation to our commemoration of the Reformation was a journey of reconciliation and repentance. In the same way, our global communion must recognize that troubled interreligious relations also are part of our history. Just as Luther wrote against the Pope and Catholicism, he wrote against Jews and, Mos and, and, Mo and Judaism uh, Muslim and Islam. As a communion, we have participated in many processes to recognize and to respond to our Lutheran tradition's difficult legacy in relation to Jews and Judaism. Today, each of our churches, including my own church, have strong open relation with both the Jewish people and many of their institution expressions. We must also recognize that this difficult history of interreligious relations also extends to Muslims and Islam. Just as 50 years of dialogue have produced major steps forward for historic reconciliation with Catholics and improved relationships with Jews, we must now embark on international processes of engagement with Muslims and Islam. Luther never could have imagined the historic reconciliation between Lutherans and Catholics. Neither could he have imagined the growing strength of our relations with Jews and Muslims around the world. As we confessed in 1984 in our LW assembly in Budapest, we not only disagree, but repudiate Luther's writing against Jews. We have taken strong steps to reverse his condemnations of the Catholic Church. We also disagree with his writings on Muslim and Islam. We argue with Luther. We receive with gratitude his explicit and clear theology of justification by faith and by grace through faith but we refuse any of his ideas that harm others and build up ourselves alone. It's worthwhile to debate his decision to side with the nobility against the peasants. How can we uncritically accept his actions? When he sided with political power, we argue with Luther, and I'm confident that the, 
that he would encourage us to do so. Self-critique is the essence of reformation. We must always ask what we have done right and what despite our best intentions we have committed and omitted. This is an essential element of Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. This dynamic self-critical approach to building relationships and trust beyond confessional and religious boundaries will help us confront ourselves of the most pressing international problems in the world today. The historic weight of Muslim Christian tensions continue to inflame problems throughout the world, especially in the Middle East. Let me say a word. We are, we are seeing a growing tension in diplomatic relationships and military threats throughout the world. The situation on the Korean Peninsula is concerning for the area and for the questions of global stability. We stand with our member churches in Korea, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, and many other countries in this moment of instability and fear. We are seeing many leaders seeking to, pro to prove their strength through threats of armed conflict. We urge leaders to instead show their strength through their strength and their wisdom through dialogue. Our world, seem, our world simply does not need more conflict and war. In the last century, we had two major wars. Our world has not yet covered, recovered from their disruption and devastation. Why should we be headed in this direction again? In the car from Lund to Malmö, Pope Francis discussed together the political situation throughout the world and the lack of constructive political leadership. His insight was that today is the role of the church to be prophetic and give moral leadership in our world and to our governments. Then we shook hands and committed to working together toward that end. So today I ask you, as leaders of the Lutheran Communion, to assume your role as prophetic leaders in your countries, showing moral leadership in a, in a broken world, seeking values and guidance. <laughs> Syria, I am afraid, can be the spark of a new world war if common human decency does not soon overcome political, economic, and military interest. Every party, locally, regionally, or globally, is seeking after their own interest and dismissing the well-being of the Syrian people themselves. These leaders, again, I'm speaking, must hear the message of Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its place. For all who take this sword will perish by this sword. Arms and interests will never resolve the problems that have engulfed Syria. Only the pursuit of human dignity, dignity that is not for sale, can liberate the people. The suffering of the Coptic communities in Egypt has too often drawn our attention to the continued problems of that country. Two Palm Sunday bombings at the Coptic Orthodox churches in Egypt were only the latest attacks. I know that the Christians in Pakistan, Sudan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and some other parts of sub-Saharan -Sub Africa can relate to such threats. In addition to these threats and fears, we also know of resilience in Christian communities. In Iraq, for instance, we know that many congregations chose this year to hold their Easter services openly, even if they did so in church buildings that have been almost destroyed by bombs. Just after an earlier bombing at St. Mark Cathy in Cairo, I was invited to pay condolences as part of a joint Muslim delegation from Palestine to, to, uh, to Egypt. With both leaders, the pressing issue was the status of Christians in the Arab and Muslim world. In response, the Grand Imam mentioned the Al-Azhar statement in December 2014, reminding Muslims that, that Christians are people of the book and have a place in all Arab and Muslim countries in the world. The Grand Mufti also suggested that they, could do, that they could do more to change the language of sermons in the mosques. Instead of reactionary exclusivism, they should be speaking a language of equality for every citizen, not only for those who belong to the same religion. 
Following this delegation, the Council of Muslim Elders invited me to an Al-Azhar conference on freedom and citizenship. In that conference, the concept of equal citizenship was again promoted, especially against the use of the word minority to diminish the status of smaller religious group. My message was to say to Muslim world that citizenship must be equal, embracing diversity. Do not use the word minority or a dhimma to offend us to, or underestimate our role in our societies. This conference can be considered a turning point for Islamic political theory. Christians have an opportunity to build on this achievement, especially when churches are attacked, at least partially, on the sense that they are less equal than others. As a global communion, we must build on these moments, promoting well-being for all communities throughout the world. Our Lutheran tradition has tremendous capacity for shaping the conversation between religious and governmental leaders, shaping policy and a culture in ways that benefit the greater good rather than the powerful or dominant parties alone. In this way, our communion can make direction contribution, not just to building better relationship for ourselves, but combating the legitimacy of religious exclusions and extremism everywhere, emerging from misguided interpretation of whatever tradition, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or others. When I assumed the office of the presidency, I prayed that the two-state solution, including a shared Jerusalem, would be resolved during these seven years. That prayer has not been clearly granted. I continue to ask you, from Jerusalem, to pray and work with me, encouraging justice to roll down like waters in our holy land. The resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in all its dimensions continues to be the core destabilizing feature of the whole Middle East. I want, to comm I want to quote Ms. Susan Shervian. God is praised in justice. God is praised in lives that look beyond themselves. There can be no praise without justice. Our song without justice are an annoying noise. Our hymns without compassion, like the scraping of stones. For praise to be complete, let justice flow, let justice flow. A response ethic for a world tuned on itself, in on itself. Liberated by God's grace, our global communion has a calling to care for communities trampled by a world turned in on itself. This calling includes responsibility to provide a witness of robust moderation, countering the many extremists of our world, especially those hiding behind religious masks. Recent global trends promoting extremism, protectionism, and populism are instead drawing us away from one another, building walls of division and threatening conflict as a way of, strength, of strengthening exclusive community identity. As a global communion built on diversity and mutual relationship, we strongly we stand against these trends promoting concern not for the strong man, savior, but for the least of these, the people of the cross. Extremist calls for egocentric policies and violence, not limited to any one religion or geographic area alone, are the essence of sin in Corvatus in Se. As churches and as a global communion, we have the opportunity to speak out for the dignity of all human beings in our weakness and diversity, not in our shining strength and uniformity. Inclusivity, a value of robust moderation, has become of mark of prophetic witness today as we have learned in our decades together as a global communion. Our liberation is mutual. We must be opened and liberated not by ourselves, but in relation to others. I want to quote Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. As long as there is poverty in the world, I can never be rich even if I have billion dollars. As long as diseases are rampant and millions of people in this world cannot expect to live more than 28 or 30 years, I can never be totally healthy even if I have just a good checkup at Mayo Clinic. 
I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you are to be or ought to be. This is the way our world is made. No individual or nation can stand out boasting of being independent. We are all interdependent. This enduring sense of interdependence <clears throat> this enduring sense of interdependence is the key of liberation. This fundamental mutuality is the mark of liberation in God's grace. These ideas are essential as we chart the future of our global communion and our relationship to churches and religions. The witness stands in stark contrast to the world, which is entering another cycle of egocentric self-interest. As countries and people, we are closing in ourselves, seeking our interest alone. The global rise of ethno-national politics and cheap populism is reinforcing the natural human tendency to consider their self and national interest to be more important than any sense of global concern. The discourse is clue. France first, Netherlands first, America first. Brexit tells us that my investment is better when I am alone, not with you. Liberation today means that we must be freed from these egocentric lies. We must create the sense that we need each other. African countries are experiencing multiple layers of internal divisions promoted by countries and corporations seeking to rob them of their natural resources. Motives informed by profit alone are best challenged by the mutual liberation found in the critical prophetical witness of Ujama, Ubuntu, and now Harambe. The These lessons are important for our communion as well. Not just the politics in our home countries and regions. The nature of our communion is togetherness. Our liberation is only with the others, not in spite of them. While we do not strive for uniformity, we can never forget that we are not alone. As King says, no individual or nation can stand out boasting of being independent we are interdependent. In the same way, I tell you, no church or individual Christian can stand out boasting of being in the independent. We, the 145 member churches of our global communion, are interdependent. Liberation is the meaning. of the reformation today. When the general secretary and, my, and I met the president of Slovenia, he asked a very open and important question. What is special about the reformation? My response was that through the reformation, we have the freshness of the gospel. Martin suggested that the reformation brought a new sense of freedom in the church. My sense is that both of these insights together help us understand the deep meaning of the continuing ongoing reformation. The reformation has inspired commitment to the freedom of every human being, respecting human rights, gender justice, freedom of conscience, and freedom of, uh, freedom of conscience as an integral part of our freedom by God's grace. The freshness of the gospel help us grasp freedom more deeply than we can imagine. The phrase Ecclesia Semper Reformanda was the first coined by the theologian Karl Barth in the mid-1940. Mid Lutherans have, of course, taken the insight of this reformed theologian and read them back into the core of Martin Luther's reformation spirit, even back to his theses on indulgences in 1517 and Heidelberg disp disputation. These parts of brilliance in Luther's early career as a reformer point to his courageous drive to reform, to rebuild, to remake the church in a spirit of repentance and faithfulness to the gospel, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, we Lutherans are challenged, both in our encounter with the gospel and in our commitment 
to evangelical Lutheran interpretations of scripture to continue this rebuilding, remaking, reforming task in this year of commemoration. It's right to remember the past, but it is right to visit Lutherstadt Wittenberg and remember the men and women who made the historic reformation possible. But it's also essential that we seek out the spirit of freshness and freedom with which the Holy Spirit moved then and continues moving today. The reformation continues because the spirit is still at work in our churches and in our world. So it's right that we are not just in Wittenberg, but in Windhoek, experiencing the liberation we find in God's church, in God's grace, in both church and society. In the year of commemoration, we are tempted to put the concept of reformation into a box. We can pretend to know exactly what happened and what it was all about. This time of remembrance and commemoration is not just about the great women and men through whom the reformation was introduced 500 years ago. It's about the movements of the spirit then, continuing through today and into the future. It's about the church being liberated by God's grace. And in the LWF today, we have 25,000 young reformers. This is this, the fruit of reformation. <laughs> the spirit calls us to work, shifting the focus from ourselves and placing it on the, to, on the world God loves. We are called to participate in the movement of the spirit. Spirit repairing and restoring ecumenical and interreligious relationships. We are called to follow the Spirit as she works on the margins of the world, proclaiming how God refuses to forget the weak and condemned, the betrayed and the occupied, those ignored by the centers of the worldly power. The Spirit blows where she will. If the phrase Ecclesia Semper Reformanda is too familiar and too comfortable for us Lutherans, the Spirit takes us into a new life of Ecclesia Semper Liberatia. The church always liberated, the church always released. God's church has been unleashed, released into the world to discern the movements of the Spirit and participate fully in God's mission. This is why. Prophetic diaconia is such a strong mark of our global communion. In the freshness and the freedom of the gospel, we have been made free to act for the sake of the world. This emphasis on freedom shapes our ecclesiology. Within our churches, we are called to cultivate a spirit of liberation, a freedom to ask difficult, even foundational questions. In this we ask, we seek good order, without imposing uniformity. Throughout our communion and within our each church, we have the freedom to challenge teaching and practice. These challenges are distinctly Lutheran when they appeal to our core commitments of sola gratia, sola scriptura, and sola fides. We are free to attempt to persuade others through scripture and reason. The interdependence of our communion reminds us, however, that these challenges are not personal or individual exercises. We question and we discern within community and in communion. My sisters and brothers in Christ, our global communion is beautifully strengthened through your courageous questioning and passionate participation. Together, we enjoy a spirituality of reformation. This spirituality by God's grace is in itself a sign of our liberation. I pray that our entire communion will be continued, renewed, and remade through the power of the cross and continued work of the Holy Spirit. Concluding remarks. As I conclude this address, I conclude my seven years in this as a president of the Lutheran Federation. These years of service have brought many remarkable experiences for me, for my church, and for my family and I hope for this communion. Through this role, my love for this global communion has been deepened. I appreciate the democratic structure of the LWF, 
with shared responsibility between governance and executive leadership. The more we encourage the roles of both the communion office and governance, we will increase the effectiveness of our work with passion for the church and for the world. We need to continue this mutual leadership, strengthening and building synergies between the distinct roles of the president and the general secretary so that they can together more effectively carry forward our mission, the mission of the communion. I dearly appreciate the intentional inclusivity within the operations of our global communion. We do not only speak about inclusion, but actively seek our strength in intergenerational and socio-economic diversity while intentionally practicing gender justice. We are creating leadership with our com within our communion that respects differences while living out our Lutheran theology of the, while living out our Lutheran theology of priesthood of all believers and the radical quality, equality of all persons before God. Day by day, we, we demonstrate our commitment to participating in what Fiorenza calls a discipleship of equals. I would like to express my gratitude to several people and groups. First, to the General Secretary. We both started new in these roles seven years ago. Each of us had some information and experience related to the LWF. But we grew together, interdependent, in these two roles together. That, that a Chilean and a Palestinian can work together with such synergy and love and mutual support is a sign that our faith breaks all borders and we are one communion. <laughs> and that we are called to a co one common mission. Two, two of us are from small churches in the global south. Leading this communion is surely a sign of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Martin. I want also to thank the vice presidents and the meeting of officers who have been wonderful co-workers. Together we have created leadership based on trust. Through this, we have become a good set of friends, establishing a friendship that will never end. This credit to extend to the council and our advisors, and along with the, all the guests from the churches and related organization. I appreciate the trust I have received from all of you, all the churches. In these seven years, I visited every region of our global communion. Wherever I visited, I was more blessed to see the specificity of each expression of Lutheran Christian faith. Each distinct community makes a thread in the tapestry of our global diversity, shaping the nature of our global communion. I am thankful for all who received me, even as I regret I was unable to accept or every invitation I got. Thank you for allowing me to lead our communion. It's important also to offer special thanks to those who have served as my advisors. I deeply appreciate the support of the Church of Norway, which allowed the Reverend Sven Oppegaard, who recently received the 2017 Ecumenical Prize of the Norwegian Council of Churches, to assist me in the first year of my presidency. I also deeply appreciate that the ELCA generously offered the time for the Reverend Dr. Robert Smith to serve as my special advisor, providing help in writing speeches, sermons, while offering theological reflection and guidance. After leaving the ELCA for an academic career, he has continued this work on a volunteer basis. With his help, I could not have managed all that I have done. From Namibia, I send my love and appreciate him to Jerusalem. I also thank my family and my church, the ELCJ. They have allowed me to fully engage my work as LWF president. They have understood that this calling to serve our global communion in this way was a call from Christ. They also understood my Christ called mission to be a servant of the servants. Only with this understanding could my wife Suad and the members of our church allow for many absences as I traveled to different parts of the world, often for long periods of time. They also understood the significance of the diaconical 
ecumenical and interreligious work we do together in the LWF. They have blessed us with their support. Finally, I thank the Lord God who has given me health, strength, and some good wisdom to serve as a president of this global communion. Liberated by God's grace, may God's name be always praised in my life and in the life of our churches and communion, soli Deo Gloria. Thank you, uh, Bishop Munib, for this powerful, articulated address. And I was asking myself, is it a Munib I used to know? It was really good. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, sisters and brothers, we remain with only six minutes before uh, midday prayer and then uh, to have our lunch. But uh, with this powerful address, I think we need to say a few words. Few people will represent us uh, from the floor, so now I would like to open the floor. If you have any point of appreciation or you want to discuss or you want to raise issues, so this is our, this is our time, thank you. Yes, um, and uh, you have to take your mic uh, go to the microphone, introduce yourself, the name, yes. and the church. Yes, the microphone is there. That is now microphone one. Then uh, we'll go to micro microphone two. There's, uh, I am Dr. Devaraj Patta from Andhra Evangelical Lutheran Church, India. I appreciate the comprehensive report or address of the president, and I'm grateful to him. But I have a, a bit of disappointment that no reference is made to the Indian context. In India, even today, the discrimination on the basis of religion continues against Christians. And the present fundamentalist government is creating mental violence on the minds of people by telling us what to eat, what not to eat, what to wear, what not to wear. So I would appreciate some mention is made regarding the Indian context. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I wanted to remind that it is only two minutes and uh, uh, <coughs> Reverend Dr. Gloria, uh, she has this. If you hear this, that is, please sit down. So now I would like to now I would like to welcome microphone two. I see Bishop Dr. Professor Finn. You are welcome. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate very much the wonderful and the powerful speech made by our president. I mean, it shows that the world is going through a lot of problems. And I sometimes I find it difficult to understand Jesus, Muhammad, they all came from Middle East, but that's the area we are having many problems. Now, they talk about dialogue between Christianity and Muslims and all that. And now, Muslim is using money to, to uh, propagate uh, Islamic teachings. Christianity is dying in Western countries. As a result of that, LWF doesn't have resources even to work with. Now, what are we, the dialogue that they are having between Muslims and Christianity, how is it going to help, especially Lutheran World Federation, to promote 
uh, teachings of Christianity so that we will be able to overcome uh, the, the problems in the world today. Oh, that's too hard. I don't see any other. Ah, there is microphone uh, four. Oh, Peter. Welcome. Is it, is it me? My name is Klaus Schäfer from the Evangelical Lutheran Church in northern Germany. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bishop uh, Yunnan, for this wonderful uh, report of the work of the President and of the state of the Lutheran World Federation. I am a German and I want to thank you particularly that you have drawn attention to this trauma in the German Namibian history. I think you did it in a very appropriate way, uh, putting it in the larger framework of comm commemoration of historical sin and of re the way towards reconciliation. I want to thank you that you addressed uh, this. And I also want to thank the Evangelical Church in Germany for this statement. I think this lays a foundation for further conversation, dialogues between the churches in Namibia and the churches in German, church in Germany, as well as between the governments of Namibia and the, the victims and the people who have been affected. I think uh, this is the way forward. And thank you very much that you have addressed this. I would love if we lift up this burden in the intercessions during our worship services during our de devotions, because the way forward still is full of obstacles and there is a lot of hurt. We lift, should lift it up in prayer towards God. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Professor Makabana will be the last. Num oh, there are two there. Okay, yeah, be brief then uh, to like, we can accommodate. First of all, uh, I, I really want to uh, very much thank uh, Brother Bishop Dr. Munim Yunan. Uh, I almost concur with him for everything included in this paper. I think I'm going to read it again and again for use in my own context. Uh, among other things, uh, this reference to the various uh, uh, dialogues that have been going on between the Lutheran communion and the different uh, other communions, uh, especially uh, this one between us and the, the, the Catholics. Uh, I was going to suggest that uh, uh, so often what happens is that discussions in a very effective way go on at the global level, but sometimes very little is known at the local level. Uh, would it be possible for this uh, assembly really to maybe to include in its report uh, something about uh, uh, making use of these developments, at the, the, the disseminating information at the local level so that really we, 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 we make use of it in a very practical way? The reference to, to dialogue. Uh, it's, it's very practical, but it's, as you rightly mentioned it, we, we have no choice. And, uh, but very little, again, is being done or being said at the local level. At least I'm referring to uh, my own African situation. And so we would, uh, we would wish that our churches uh, do something more than uh, has been done so far in this regard. And so many other points that you raised, I'm so grateful for, for that, thank you. I will speak German, as I am Nisha, from the Evangelic Lutheran Church in Slovenia. Dear President, thank you very much for your speech. You quoted the Slovenian president, and I would like to thank for the meeting we were able to have in Slovenia. 
because on the basis of uh, that meeting and the visit of both of you and other people in Slovenia, we were able to do many things, although we are a very small church, only 1% of the population, but uh, the Slovenian president, uh, whom you quoted in 2017, has declared the year of reformation for Slovenia, and this was very beautiful for us in that small country that we were able to celebrate 500 years of reformation in such a way. I would like to thank you for it. Yeah, now I would like to welcome again Bishop Dr. Munib, if there is any reaction well, for that short. First of all, I would like to thank you for this appreciation and for these questions. I think it's very important that we are interacting on many of these issues that you have mentioned. I would like to say yes, I know I didn't mention India, but when I mentioned about interreligious extremism and problems, of course, and I wrote about Hinduism, I'm aware of the interreligious problems and crimes that happen in India. But at the same time, with my limited time, I cannot raise the whole issues of the whole world. I'm really sorry, but I am really, in my mind, was also India. And I want to remind you that we in the LWF have clear policies on these issues, and we have always taken the issue of the Dalit as an agenda item in our work. So India is not forgotten, forgotten. India is in our heart as well. Secondly, I would like to say to my brother, I, would, I don't like this generalization when you say the Western churches are dead. This is not right. I visited many of these Western churches. You have to understand the complexity, but at the same time, I would like to encourage you to see the faithfulness for the gospel of love in many of our member churches in the West, if you like to call them so. We have to see it with a clear eye. Many churches and congregations have been reviving my faith when I visited them. So generalization can be very dangerous in our communion. The spirituality, Lutheran spirituality is existing in all our 145 churches. And I always, I am touched by their faithfulness to the gospel, each in their own tradition, culture, as well as in their own context. Thank you for seeing that. Concerning, I'm really thankful for uh, <coughs> Dr. Klaus Schaefer for, you, you, I mean, accepting what we are offering. Yes, thank you for being a German appreciating what we are saying. And I want to promise you that here in, <coughs> in this assembly, there will be a statement on this issue. And we can do it together with the German churches, with all dignity and respect, and with non-Muslim churches. So I think this is a good movement what we show to repent of the past, but not allow the past to determine our future. I would, like, I would like also to, uh, to conclude the last remark. Thank you for all who have really thanked me, but more important, religious extremism today is the pandemic of our world. And there is no religion, not even Christianity, is clear of that. Or there is no religion that has a monopoly. For this reason, Today, all of us have to combat through education and interfaith dialogue this kind of extremism that is existing in our world. In all our countries, there is no one with any exception. But I want to tell you, I will serve on the Royal Committee of Granting Prizes for Muslim-Christian relations in the world. <coughs> Last week, the King of Jordan has given to three, one from Canada, one from the United States, and one from Africa, prices. 83 applied. That means we should not allow extremists to kidnap our world. We should really raise our voices 
against this extremism, educate our grassroots through interfaith dialogue. And a good source, Bishop Bonkabana, is use from conflict, the liturgy from conflict to communion. It's a good source, even in our, in, in our way, for even doing this interfaith dialogue, repenting, but at the same time, looking forward, liberated by God's grace, by faith. This is our heritage and our tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop. President Muni, now for our records, we need to uh, receive this uh, address of Lutheran Federation President by, by vote. So we'll be using these uh, digital things by voting. This is a very advanced assembly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so we are going to vote to receive the address of the Lutheran World Federation president to the 12th assembly. They are working on it, eh? Okay. Number one is four. Number two, against. And number three, I don't think if we have, but uh, withheld. Four, against, and withheld. I mean, abstention. So vote now. Vote is closing. Vote is closed. <laughs> so it's received. Thank you very much. President. I'd like to uh, welcome the General Secretary in case of announcements. So uh, there are several announcements before we do uh, our midday prayer. Bear with us. Um, already some information regarding the welcome reception this evening. Uh, security, uh, it has been mentioned, but a reminder, we have to follow the Namibian security protocol as visitors to Namibia. It is their way to show hospitality to us. And therefore, they have set up security checks at the entry point. The same security checks will be done tonight at the reception with the president. Please don't, please don't bring too many bags to the reception tonight. <laughs> Knives, pistols, guns, scissors, lighters, sharp objects, and alcohol beverages are not allowed at the venue and reception security guards will confiscate them during the entry points. First, uh, a reminder then also, you will need these accreditations. Without these accreditations, you are not going to be allowed uh, to enter into the compound. After plenary one, the buses are set will leave at 16.30 outside the safari main gate. The buses will leave as soon as they are full Therefore, please make sure that you proceed straight away after the close of the plenary towards the main gate. With respect to the transport back to the hotels after the welcome reception, there will be the eight buses for the different hotels. In addition, there will be six buses back to Safari Hotel and Arebush Hotel. Each bus is clearly marked to which hotel it will go. Now, um, several announcements coming uh, I will try to organize them. Um, the Policy and Reference Committee will take place at 14 hours in Etosha 1, in the Safari Court Hotel after lunch. 14 hours, Etosha 1, Policy and Reference. The Credential and Elections uh, Committee uh, will meet at 13.15 to 15 hours in room IIs, Please take your meals to the room. Uh, there is also 
Um, yeah, that will leave for later. So I have here, can the chair dismiss the policy committee, policy and reference committee first because of food? Can we wait for the policy and reference committee which will take food and meat? Can we allow them not to queue, but to be first in picking food? We wait some five minutes and let uh, them leave and then we follow them. This is a way of helping their very important work uh, for our sake here as the assembly. Then, uh, just to conclude, this is not a standalone assembly. Bishop Munib has said that very eloquently. Uh, you have banners on uh, all the walls, uh, each one for one of our preceding assemblies. You will see 11 banners with the history of earlier assemblies beginning in Lund, Hanover, Minneapolis, Helsinki, uh, Hungary, uh, Dar es Salaam, Dar es Salaam, Hungary, uh, Curitiba, Hong Kong, Winnipeg, Stuttgart, and now Namibia, that's for the next assembly. Have a look, I think it is worthwhile to have. Finally, you saw uh, in your last update uh, received by email that in the ecumenical movement organized by the WCC, there is the campaign called Thursdays in Black to overcome sexual and gender-based violence. People wear black as a sign of solidarity. Tomorrow is a Thursday, May 11, and all are invited to consider wearing black or at least one piece of black because many may not have everything there. These would be the announcements I have to present. Thank you, General Secretary. Now I would like to welcome the uh, worship committee for midday prayer. Thank you.